Hi, today I want to talk to you about using JavaScript with ASP.NET. Now, if you're an ASP.NET programmer, you might be asking yourself, why do I still need to use JavaScript? ASP.NET is so powerful. JavaScript is still one of the foundation skills that you need to have if you want to do any serious web development. It's everywhere on the web. You're going to be seeing it all the time. You need to be able to understand it. And JavaScript operates completely within the browser at the local level on the front end. So you can do quite a bit of work within the browser without having to do that extra trip back to the server or do the page refresh that ASP.NET very often requires. So you can save time, you can improve your user experience, and again, you can carry out some fairly impressive tasks like dynamically changing the, the content of the page, user input validation, as you'll see here, and quite a bit more. So that's why you really do need to still be familiar with JavaScript if you want to do the really serious web development. So let's take a look at this mock-up that I have here of a new user registration page. You have your typical fields, the username, password, password confirmation, and a submit button. And going back to the source, you can see that most of these are ASP.NET controls. Uh, we have a single HTML control here, a label that's going to be shown, that's going to be used to show the user an error message or a success message, whichever one. You have the ASP.NET controls here. Many of the attributes are similar to HTML controls. You got the standard ID. You have the run at server instruction that's used to instruct ASP.NET to run the control on the server and access .NET code. That's fairly important. And you have the on client click event. Now that has a single line of JavaScript that returns a true or a false value from the function that you see down here. Now, if that returns a false value, what that's going to do is stop the on-click event of ASP.NET from even running. ASP.NET has its own on-click event, and when it renders the page to the user's browser, it's going to substitute this for the on-click event that HTML uses for the button. And if this returns a false value, the ASP.NET on click event won't even run. It will stop right there, so we won't go back to the server. If it returns a true value, then it will know that it can continue on to the ASP.NET function and it can go ahead and save the information. So it's important that you use the return keyword here, and it's important that this function return a true or a false value. So let's go ahead and take a look at the function itself. We get the validate new login function. It starts off by declaring a return value, and I'm going to assume that's a, that everything's okay to start out with. We can always set, set it as a false later on. So it, it declares the return value. Then it comes down here and it gets the values from the fields. It uses document, get element by ID, which is pretty much a staple within JavaScript programming because it you can get you can get values from elements within the page. But when dealing with ASP.NET controls, we need a special syntax here. And that's the angle bracket, percent sign, and equal sign, and then percent sign and angle bracket to close. And what that does, that actually gives you access to the ASP.NET control itself and some of the IntelliSense that goes with it. And what we're using here is the client ID property. Now, with ASP.NET controls, as you saw up here, they do actually have the ID as a normal HTML control does. But with ASP.NET, you're very often using master pages to provide a template for the ASP.NET page. And because these controls are sitting within the placeholder within that template, within the portion of that template that you can actually edit, it changes those ID names when it renders the page to the browser. So you actually have to use that client ID 
in order to find out what ID is going to be given to that to that control so that you, the JavaScript can reference it. So what this is doing, it's getting the value from the fields, assigning it to the variable, coming down here and running the tests. So we can check to see if the confirmation matches the original password. We can assign that Boolean condition to the return value. You know, if that's still true, then we can check the password length and so on. Then we can come down here and then we can set the the message back to the user. You got that one label control that I showed you earlier. You set the inner text to either saving if everything's true or to an error message if any of the tests failed. And then it returns that value that it set up. It, it returns that variable back to the on client click event. And if that's, again, if that's false, that's going to stop the ASP.NET event from even running. So that's basically how the JavaScript works in there. Now with a JavaScript event, you've got the script block here and you want to make sure that the, the script block is within the content block for ASP because otherwise it won't be able to access the fields within the ASP.NET page. So, but that's one thing. And again, you need to use these tags in order to access the controls and make sure you get the proper ID for the control so JavaScript can reference it. And you'll see that in a second. Now, another thing you could do, instead of using the client ID, you could use another property within the ASP.NET controls, which is called client ID mode. You can say client ID mode equals, and it gives you a few choices here, and one of them is static. And what that will actually do is to maintain the IDs that you assign to the controls. So you, you'll know what they are. And then you can come down here in the case of this one is text password confirm. You could get rid of these and just say text password confirm. Now that works a lot of the time with some advanced JavaScript functions, it might not work. So sometimes client ID is preferable. So client ID is pretty dependable, but if you want, in many cases, you can also do the client ID mode and work it that way too. So let's go ahead and run this and always remember the single quotes there so that it's going to get those IDs correctly. Let's go ahead and run this, see how it works. Give that just a minute to so, okay, here we go. Let's go ahead and take a look at the source code first. And as you can see, the HTML source code is pretty similar to what you saw in Visual Studio, but you can see that it's actually replaced the IDs there. It's put the name of the content placeholder there in front of the ID that I assigned, but that's okay because it did the same thing in the JavaScript. The client ID property of the control gave us the same ID that it placed within the control itself. So that's that's going to work. That reference is still good. And let's go ahead and close that. Let's hit F12, which brings up Google Chrome's developer tools. And we can actually see the source code. And one of the handy things about this is that we can set breakpoints which is very helpful when you're debugging your JavaScript. You can set breakpoints to see what's going on where and see where any errors are happening. Let's go ahead and try some sample values. Test, test. This should fail because the password is only four characters in length, even though they match. 
So let's create account. It's stopped at the breakpoint. It's gotten those values. It will do the test. Okay, so the first test passes, they match. False. So that fails. And let's go ahead and resume. And there we get our error message back to the user saying, sorry, you need to enter at least eight characters for the password. So that works well. Now let's try doing one that we're, we know is going to work. Let's get rid of this breakpoint. Close the developer tools, create account, and it goes right through. So that passed and it went through to the .NET code as it was supposed to. And I don't actually want that to run. So I set the breakpoint in .NET and that's fine. So just from this example, you can see some of the tasks that could be performed with JavaScript. And it's not just about user validation. JavaScript can handle anything that does not need interaction with the server. Of, co of course, using Node.js, you know, that's changing somewhat. You can use it in other environments. But within HTML, JavaScript can do quite a bit on the front end very quickly. And if you're a C-sharp programmer like me, then you'll notice that the syntax is very similar. It's almost identical in many cases. So once you know C-sharp or JavaScript, learning the other is that much easier. So there's, there's less of a reason not to learn it. You really have no reason not to. Now, another aspect of learning to work with JavaScript is getting to know the new HTML5 controls. HTML5 has introduced a number of new types of controls. You have date time, specific date time controls, email, image. Well, you always had the image control, I believe. You have specific number controls that will only allow numbers, which can be very handy for eliminating user errors. And you have a number of other types of controls that you can use within HTML5. Now, if your browser doesn't support these specific controls very often, it will just render them as a text box. But if it does, and most browsers do now, they come in very handy. And you can do some really great stuff. You can produce some sophisticated applications right there in the browser with just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And you can reserve a uh, you can reserve ASP.NET for where it's really needed for those trips back to the server. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video informative. If you'd like to read the full article, you can find that on commosoftware.com. And be sure to check back here for future videos. Have a great day.